The Jump Title War here, and today we're doing another tier list using Tier Maker, this time covering Bretonia. So Bretonia is one of my favorite races to play in Total War Warhammer 2, although I think I might be in a little bit of a minority, I think that they actually might be a bit unpopular. Uh, there's definitely some quirks to Bretonia, and they don't play like many of the other races, despite maybe looking like they could. Uh, they've got a few things to them that if you don't fully understand them, it can be a bit off. So I think with this particular tier list here, I'm definitely going to have to talk a bit more about how they play on the campaign map and the sort of quirks around them in order to make a lot of this stuff actually make sense. Now, as always, we're rating this based off legendary difficulty campaign, very hard battle difficulty, no mods, no multiplayer um, on ultra unit scale. If you're not playing on those settings, you're probably going to have a differing result. Now, one thing that I really want to address here is when people talk about normal battle difficulty. Um, happens in every single video, somebody comments, oh, I disagree with Legend, because on normal difficulty, that unit's actually good. And the thing is, I would probably agree with you, because on normal difficulty, certain units that are really bad on very hard actually become quite viable. But that just wasn't what we're talking about. And Bretonnia is a race that is very heavily punished by very hard battle difficulty. And I think a lot of people just can't get their head around the fact that some people actually play very hard battle difficulty. Well, I can tell you, it might be a minority of people, but they absolutely do. Now, if I made this tier list based on normal difficulty, guess what? Everything's just going in B rank. Just everything. But when we play on very hard battle difficulty, certain units start to shine and some units start to fall behind, and that's where the distinctions need to be made. And I feel like this tier list would be way more useful to people playing on higher difficulties than lower difficulties. Like, if you're playing on Bretonnia on lower difficulties, just play Bretonnia and figure it out, and you'll be fine, more or less. You just don't need this tier list, so I just want to make that distinction. Anyway, let's talk about melee infantry first. Now, this bit here is uh, probably going to be the most contested, because whenever we've covered melee infantry in the past with the other tier lists, I've mostly put them in trash, but there's usually been one or two that either enter the C, B, or even A tier. And in the case of yesterday with the uh, the Wood Elves, uh, we had one that actually entered uh, the Doomstack tier. But guess what? With Bretonnia, they have, without a shadow of the doubt, the worst melee infantry in Total War Warhammer 2. Every single one of their melee infantry is going in the trash. Okay, and I will explain why that is, of course. I'm not just going to be like, oh, they're crap, and then give no explanation. But straight away, they all suffer from the exact same problem. All they have is just differing stats. That's it. All right, so we'll have to go into the campaign and actually explain what the fuck is wrong with their melee infantry. So, when you play as Bretonnia, you have a peasant limit. You don't have supply lines, but you've got peasant limit. Now, in the early stages of the campaign you aren't able to recruit a full stack. You just will not be able to. You don't have enough peasant limit. You can go over your peasant limit, but if you do that, you'll stifle your economy. Now, the Bretonian economy is really good. So my recommendation, if you want to play a strong Bretonian campaign, is recruit the 15 units that you can recruit and then fill up the rest of those slots to get a full stack with lords. Now, lords, when recruiting them at tier one, um, right? They are, they don't have a particularly high upkeep. They already start off with a, um, with a war horse. So if they're coming in as reinforcements, because you can't have four lords attached to one army, right? So you have your main army, and then you have two reinforcing lords and one prophetess of life. So that means you've got three war horse lords as your front line, and you've got a prophetess there keeping them healed, right? which is way more effective than using melee infantry because life magic complements single entities way more than infantry units because as an infantry unit dies, life magic just can't bring them back to life. Whereas a single entity, until it actually is killed, can benefit, almost get all of their health back. So that's not it as well. Another thing is that there are limited build slots with Bretonnia, right? And if you're going to play an effective Bretonnia campaign, you have to understand how their economy works. Not only do you have to keep their peasant limit down to a certain extent, keep it at least under at a certain threshold. You don't want to go over. Um, and every single one of their melee infantry is uh, takes up a peasant slot. But also their um, economic buildings make it so that you are not really incentivized to build their recruitment building in the early stages of the campaign. So even though 
with Corone, you might start off with the training field. It's actually better to demolish it straight away and immediately build a landed estate because having access to this unit here, it, it, these units, is not worth missing out 300 gold, right? And as you rank up the building and start getting more build slots, you'll then get access to the windmill. Now, the windmill will give access to extra growth in that province and in, in adjacent provinces as well. So it has added benefits. So as you fill up your minor settlements, settlements you'll, you'll start to find that there's not really any room for recruitment buildings for at least for melee infantry but the thing is archers and peasants are recruited from the landed estate so they'll be readily available because it's just really convenient now in terms of the training field you can build it but you shouldn't build it in minor settlements because their best unit which comes at tier 4, you won't be able to get access to it until it gets to tier 4. If you build it in a minor settlement, you'll never be able to get it, right? And you definitely shouldn't be building too many of these buildings. They just provide no economic advantage. Now, the thing is, looking at the actual stats and the performance of Bretonian infantry units, they're all low leadership, they all use up a peasant slot, they all have low damage, and their role is performed better by other units. The fact that they have cheap upkeep doesn't matter because it's better to make more money and recruit knights or lords than to make less money and recruit cheaper units like peasants. It is not worth it to fill your army full of peasant mob. These guys here have no combat potential whatsoever. The fact that they're free upkeep doesn't matter. Bretonia's economy is not bad. I know this is very late in the campaign, but Bretonia's economy is very good. If you have a look at what these buildings can actually end up making, you can make tons of cash. In fact, Bretonia has one of the strongest economic buildings in the game. And so if you focus on your ec economics, you can just build better units and there's just no reason to ever go for the peasants now there's also this unit over here the battle pilgrim and this one here is not too bad um it does have frenzy its leadership's not too bad but its killing potential is just not great so by the time you get this you've got access to cavalry units i would just skip it entirely um so that's why melee infantry for bretonia it's just not their strong point in fact it's their weak point and as i've always said if you're going to play a race effectively, look, by all means, play a race however you want. If you want to recruit melee infantry into your armies, no problem. But just keep in mind that if you're playing on very hard battle difficulty, these guys here will never be able to punch up above their weight. And it's really important that if you are playing on higher difficulties, that you have armies that don't necessarily always do that, but can do that. Because the way that you win battles is by inflicting the army losses, right? Every single battle will end, unless you're fighting an unbreakable army, will end with the army losses. And the way that the army losses is calculated is based on how well your army punches up or how badly it punches down, right? So if you recruit a unit that... Okay, let's just take this one here into example, the, the foot squire, right? Uh, the foot squire... Uh, let, okay, we'll, we'll use its upkeep cost as 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 an example of like value. Okay, it costs 175, right? Now this is the equivalent of like the great sword. It's cheaper than the Empire great swords and comes in at tier four. I think the fact that it comes in at tier four is totally unacceptable. It has bonus versus infantry, but it is a peasant unit and it has pretty low attack stats and relatively low leadership for you know an elite unit, right? It doesn't have shields as well. Now if this unit goes into a battle and inflicts 160 coin worth of damage. It hasn't done its worth, right? So it is better to recruit a cheaper unit, let's just say this one here, at 100 gold. If this one here dishes out 140 gold worth of damage, right? Even though it's less damage than what the Foot Squire has dealt it with, this one here has not punched, is not equaled its worth, but this one here has gone above its worth. And so the game will adjudicate you a win earlier. Another thing to consideration is that, of course, you can replenish your ammunition after every battle, and Bretonia has one of the slowest replenishment rates in the game, and since me melee infantry always get absolutely smashed in every battle, you're going to want to make sure that you take minimal casualties. So, <laughs> these guys are not incentivized whatsoever. There's literally no upside to recruiting them. And again, if you're thinking, you know, raging in your head, thinking to yourself, but what are you going to do to protect your archers? 
First thing, your archers aren't worth shit. Don't worry about protecting them. Just put them in a checkerboard formation, and if they die, they die, right? They'll still dish out a ton of damage, right? The second thing is that we've already established that you use your lords to hold them back. Lords can hold back enemy units way longer than melee infantry, and you can heal your lords to keep them into the fight. And as you've got more lords onto the battlefield, you're getting their vows done, which is really important for the late campaign. Getting more vows done early is really good. It'll, it'll fix you up in the late campaign. So, no advantage to them at all. Right, moving on to archery units now. Uh, we've got the Peasant Bowman, Peasant Bowman with Fire Arrows, Peasant Bowman with Pox Arrows. Now, all three of these are very convenient. This one here, you're going to build this building. No, no unit is recruited straight from the barracks, so you need to actually, sorry, straight from the settlement. So you have to have, there's no like tier zero unit, even the peasant need uh, a field. Um, but this is the building that you're going to want to prioritize before anything else. Even before the growth building, because that only provides plus 10 growth. Uh, so it's not really that big of a deal, right? Um, so you build the fields, you've got access to the peasant bowmen. As soon as you get to tier 2, you've got access to the upgraded farm. You definitely want to do that because you want this one as well. So all three of these archers are all really convenient. Um, these are just cheap and basic ammunition. This one here does more damage, um, but less armor piercing. And this one here has got the same amount of base damage as the Peasant Bowman, but it comes with poison. And they're only a little bit more expensive than the Peasant Bowman, so it's it's really negligible in terms of worrying about cost. As I said before, the Bretonia, if you focus on economy, you don't really ever need to worry about money with Bretonia. You just need to worry about the actual Peasant Limit, at least in the early stages of the campaign. So all three of these are A tier. They definitely don't belong in Doomstack. But these are very viable early game peasants. If you're going to fill your army with peasants, these are the guys to do it. They will outperform melee infantry three, four, five times over over the course of a campaign because of the various problems that melee infantry suffer. Archers just don't have the uphill battle that melee infantry have to deal with. Now, cavalry for Bretonia will have to deal with that uphill battle, but we'll get to that in a bit. Now, they've got a horse archer unit, so I'm going to categorize that under the archery category because they've only otherwise got three archers. So the, uh, the human archers here, the mounted human archers, these ones are okay. They don't have as much uh, range as other missile cavalry, such as... Um, the Glade Riders for the Wood Elves or the Illyrian Reaver Archers with the High Elves. Um, but for their price point, they are a tier 1 unit. You are definitely going to want to build the Cavalry Building because not only does it give you access to your best units, but it also increases your capacity for Paladins, which are a very good melee hero. So there's dual purposes. That's the big thing about the melee infantry. There's no hero associated with it. There's no economic benefit from it. The game doesn't incentivize you to build this. And just have that building sitting there. There's just other buildings that provide you with so many benefits. That's that's a really important thing to consider. How you're building your settlements will largely dictate how you build your armies. Because you've got this building over here, right? You want to build that because it provides armor plus two for all units faction. Well, it's providing a benefit plus it's providing global recruitment. This one over here is providing uh, Lord Recruit Rank plus one and increasing your capacity for... Um, for damsels and providing untainted and providing extra garrison. This one here is providing you with artillery. This one here just provides you with literally your worst units. Just as I've said before, if your if if your faction is weak in some way, don't play into their weaknesses. Play into their strengths. Just ignore their weaknesses. Find some way to work around it. Every race has a weakness, and you just work around it. Don't play into it and you'll get better results. All right, so we're, we're back to mounted yeoman archers, right? These guys are pretty good. Relatively cheap. Take up a peasant slot. So they don't have as much killing potential as an archer unit, but what the uh, the mounted yeoman archers are best at handling is Norskan invasions. Now, if you're playing as Karone specifically, you're going to have Norskan invasions come down. It's, it's inevitable, right? The problem that peasant bowmen will have against Norskans is that they won't actually be able to outrun them and skirmish them, and some of the Norskan units will come in... Um, pretty hot and heavy. Whereas, if you spam mounted yeoman archers, these guys here, Norskans can't catch them, right? And as long as you're not severely outpowered, you can fight them, skirmish the hell out of them, and even if you don't win, then you just beat them in the set in the next battle. They're cheap, and you can get rid of them that way, because Norskans are just a massive pain in the ass. And again, because you don't have supply lines, you're not really worrying too much about about having multiple armies. So these guys here, I'm going to put them at B tier because they definitely don't have the killing potential of regular archers because they have fewer entities, less ammunition, and you can use them to run enemy units down, but apart from that, they're just they're just B tier, they're a tier below them. All right, the uh, now we're moving on to melee cavalry. So this is where Bretonia is really going to be distinct 
from other races in terms of cavalry. Oh, uh, there's also Grail Relic. Uh, I, that one kind of a bit off in terms of where do I place that. It's it's a support infantry unit. Should that have been under melee infantry? Not really. I don't know. It, I mean, it is there to support melee infantry, but they're on a horse. Well, not really. It's a dead horse. <laughs> where, where do we place the Grail Relic? I'm, I'm going to cover this one first. I know exactly where to put it. I just don't know when I, when I should have covered this one. Um... It's pretty obvious where this one goes. Right in the fucking bin where it belongs. Probably, hands down, the worst unit in the game, bar none. There should be a Z tier where this unit belongs. This is such a piece of crap. In a game where single entities dominate, what the fuck is wrong with this unit? It has... It's just got nothing going for it. For one thing, it um, takes up a peasant slot. It, for a single entity, weapon strength of 45, that is disgustingly low. It has no killing potential whatsoever. And what's its support that it provides? It provides plus 12 leadership in a 55 effect area. Now, that's not particularly large of, of an effect area. The 12 leadership is definitely good, don't get me wrong. But what unit do you think the Icon of Devotion is mostly going to benefit? melee infantry because never going to keep up with cavalry right and nor does it need to because cavalry don't have leadership problems the bretonian infantry definitely have leadership problems so if you're forming up a blob this will be useful with melee infantry but you shouldn't do that with bretonia and you shouldn't recruit their melee infantry so since this is a support unit for melee infantry it belongs with the melee infantry in the trash it just doesn't really serve a purpose the fact that it has um uh 20 physical resistance is it doesn't matter like who cares if this this can't hold the line it's terrible it's just such an awful unit so yeah it definitely belongs down there all right moving on to the uh the mounted yeoman so back to cavalry melee cavalry okay so um this one here yeah it's just basically cheap crap um the f the mounted yeoman archers while they don't have quite as good melee stats as the mounted yeoman i mean these stats here aren't even going to be able to beat basic archers they're just too weak so these ones here just have more killing potential, and if you need to run down enemy units, my recommendation is definitely use Mounted Yeoman Archers. So in terms of where to put the uh, these guys, I just put them straight in the trash. Pick these over them, they're just way better. Even for, you know, they, they do cost a little bit extra, but it's worth it. These guys here just don't, they can't do anything, and they're not going to punch above their value, which is, again, something that you really need to focus on. Don't focus too much on, oh, but it's cheaper. Bretonia makes loads of money. If you're if you're losing money as Bretonia, you're doing something wrong, okay? So, not a priority. Next up are the Knights Errant. So, now we start moving into units that, rather than require the peasant limit, they require vows to be sorted. And it's very important that before you put any knights into your army, that you do sort out these vows. Alright, it's very easy to get some of these vows sorted, and your legendary lords will already at the start of the campaign have some vows sorted so that the uh let's actually we should probably talk about the vows uh, before we go any further so I just pick someone at random you know who I am. have a look at their vows okay so the units that fall under each category in terms of knight's vow you got knight's errant knight's of the realm and pegasus knights now the the uh the knight's vow is very easy to do you either do five technologies five um construction be in the region when a construction is finished that's very easy to do or level up five times so get them to level six all three of those are very easy to do be wary about doing pledge to knowledge in the late campaign when you finished all of your technologies because if there's no technologies left to do he'll never finish his vow so just be wary about that um the most difficult of the vow to do is actually the questing vow it only boosts questing knights um and you the easiest way to do it is to win a battle at sea, but you can't always just guarantee a battle at sea is going to be readily available unless you declare war on somebody that's across the sea from you, which isn't too bad. Um, so Norse guns will usually come uh, down from the sea, but sometimes they run away from you. It can be tricky to catch them. Um, but yeah, that's how you get the questing vow done. The Grail vow is done most easily by... Um, by just defeating five lords so in many ways the grail vow is actually the easiest to do uh there are other ways to do the uh the pledge to uh, well the uh, the questing vow but 
I found that the winner battle at sea is the easiest. One of them is actually, there's a bit of a trap in here as well. Um, defeat a Dark Elf Legendary Lord, but be aware that that actually doesn't include Rakath. Rak unless they patch this, which I'm not so, uh, certain of, um, Rakath doesn't actually count towards a Dark Elf Legendary Lord. And so if you pledge to, I can't remember which pledge it is, and defeat Rakath, it won't count. So just be very careful. Again, they may have patched that, but last time I played it, they didn't. So just be careful of that. Alright, so we were talking about Knights Errant. So you need to get the um, the, uh, the Knights Vow done. This is another reason why it's important to recruit a bunch of Lords at the early stages of the campaign, so that they can gain whatever type of Vow that they need to, so that they can actually recruit Knights. Because uh, your money is not the problem. The problem is the Peasant Limit. Right? Knights Errant, they're just a good cavalry unit. They're relatively cheap. Like 175, that's the same price as Foot Squires, right? And I would say that this has way more killing potential. This is what this is primarily why I put foot squires down so low, right? Tier four versus tier two, fucking same killing potential, right? Doesn't use up a peasant limit. Does use up a peasant limit. You can have this unit be completely free of upkeep. You can't have this unit completely free of upkeep. So I mean, that's using an exploit, and I'm not going to judge uh, this list based off that. So I, I probably should have made that distinction. But yeah. You've just got better options uh, with the melee infantry. So Knights Errant, actually a, a decent unit. I've used them to pretty good effect. They don't have any advantage versus infantry or cavalry. They're just dis just decent heavy cavalry. Decent speed as well at 75 speed, which is what you want your cavalry to be at. They need to be able to move, move around the battlefield quickly. I would put Knights Errant at B tier. So I think it's a good solid tier for it. Next up is the Knights of the Realm. So Knights of the Realm... Something's going on here. Okay, Knights of the Realm here. Uh, tier 3, yeah, that's much better. Uh, tier 3 unit, a little bit more expensive than the Knights Errant. Uses the same Vow, so the Knights Vow. So by the time you get to Tier 3, you should have a bunch of Lords with the, uh, the Knights Vow sorted. Now, this is actually one of my favorite cavalry units in the game. Because this has a lot of versatility. Uh, they've got a good amount of speed, good amount of armor. They're decent amount of leadership and they have anti-large and a good amount of anti-large of that bonus versus large plus 10 meaning that they're going to be better against enemy cavalry units and monsters and since you're going to be dealing with norska norska brings down monsters here uh, every now and again like um uh, skin wolves and such like that and knights of the realm actually handle them quite well so overall a good solid cavalry unit with a really good charge bonus and since they're definitely worth the price point a tier and it's not very often you're going to see a cavalry unit at high tier like this. And guess what? This is only the beginning for Bretonia. Next up, we've got the Questing Knight. Uh, also at tier 3. It's kind of a weird situation with the Questing Knight because it requires sort of like the tier 2 Vow. But we've got the Pegasus Knights that are tier 4 that require the tier 1 Vow. So Questing Knights, they are sort of like the, the anti-infantry variant at tier 3 for Bretonia. Where you've got... It's not necessarily anti-infantry, but they have uh, armor piercing and they don't have a bonus with infantry or large. Um, so you get this unit here to deal with armored infantry and you use Knights of the Realm to deal with anti-large, uh, to deal with large stuff, right? So overall, they're just got good stats, decent speed as long as they've got the 75 speed and their price point, I think, matches what they can do. And since you don't have to worry about supply lines, their price never goes up and only actually ever goes down because there's buildings that can reduce it um, by globally by a small amount. And of course, there's an exploit, but uh, like I said, I'm not judging it based on that. I'm going to put them at A tier because these honestly perform really well for me in terms of the Bretonnia roster. Uh, I think that combinations of armies with archers and cavalry is the way to go. Just skip their melee infantry entirely. All right, next up we have the Pegasus Knight. Now, this is the ideal unit to bring if you want a unit to take out, um, if you want a knight unit to take out settlements. Um, the big weakness to regular cavalry is, of course, they can't climb up the walls, and getting stuck in the middle of a choke point is really bad for them. So you, if, you, if you're going to go and take up a walled settlement and you didn't bring loads of peasant archers, Pegasus Knights are the way to go. So where I'm going to put them is... A tier. They're an A tier unit. They do the job really well. They, the big thing to worry about them is don't get into a melee infantry blob because they get stuck really, really quite easily and they can get killed because they kind of spaced out 
quite a lot. So what ha ends up happening is they charge into the middle of a blob, and then like 15 entities are attacking them at once, and they just get killed really quickly. Because they don't charge into the side of a unit, they charge like right into the middle of it. So that's fine if you're targeting isolated units, or if you can break it straight away. So there definitely is some issues with it, but if you know what you're doing, you can do quite well with them. They also pair quite nicely with life magic, because they have high amounts of health per entity. Alright, next up after that, let me have a quick look. We've got the Grail Knights. So, the tier 4 unit that requires the Grail Veil to be sorted. Okay, so the the uh, the Grail Knight. Um, I'm going to put it at A tier. I don't think you can really justify putting it under Doomstack because of their inability to handle sieges. But this is actually what I would classify as the best like horse cavalry unit in the game uh they have perfect vigor so they never get exhausted they get a decent amount of speed good amount of armor good amount of health fairly expensive but that's not a problem for Britannia. not at all really um good amount of weapon strength they've got bonus versus large good amount of charge bonus um if you cycle charge them well enough they can smash through just about any army in the game on the field be, be very wary about bringing these guys into sieges you just need to have other armies that are basically specialized to sieges and armies that are specialized for field battles these guys are definitely not this is why they didn't end up in doomstack if you can't handle sieges you can't get doomstack status but otherwise this is arguably one of the best cavalry units in the game i absolutely love them um don't usually recruit them that often because i just i usually go with cheaper options but i really do like grail knights they're very good especially against vampire accounts getting rid of hex race they absolutely demolish them okay next up after that we have uh, we'll save the flying ones for last we've got the grail guardian so this one also requires the uh, uh the grail vow but it's actually built from the grail shrine um this one here is classified as anti-infantry but it actually doesn't have any bonus versus infantry and actually kind of has low weapon strength um doesn't have particularly high charge bonus either so what is it that makes grail guardians good or bad well it comes down to this they have really high melee defense so grail guardians are a bit of a weird thing where they kind of act like melee infantry and hold the line which is not what they're designed to do they do have perfect vigor but they're also tier five now in my opinion the grail knights have way more killing cap uh, capacity than the grail guardians they've got more weapon strength they've got more charge bonus they've got more melee attack wait do they yeah, they've got more melee attack. They've both got um, um, magic attack. Now, the only big difference between them is 30 melee defense compared to 56 melee defense. Now, in terms of cavalry, I value weapon strength, melee attack, and charge bonus more than melee defense. It doesn't really matter that much that these guys can hold the line. They shouldn't really be getting hit. They should be charging in and pulling out. So they, they're a bit of a weird situation. And they're the most expensive of the landed cavalry unit. Now, I did see some comments thinking that I would actually put Grail Guardians in like the high tiers, but I'm actually going to put it at B tier because it performs a really weird role that I just don't think works well for Petonia. If you're going to recruit cavalry, you've got these excellent choices here, which are damage dealers. And this one here just doesn't dish out the damage. And you really kind of wish that it did. Anyway, moving on to their Flying Cavalry. We're starting off with the Royal Pegasus Knights. Both of these are now Tier 5 units. Okay, so we've got 320 upkeep costs compared to 500 upkeep costs with the Royal Hippogriff Knights. So this one here is a much cheaper variant. They're the upgraded variant of the Pegasus Knight. This one being the Knight's Vow unit. This one being the, um, the Grail Vow one. Uh, we've got the Perfect Vigor on it, um, Anti-Large. They're just, they're just a straight up upgrade of the Pegasus Knight. However, because it's at tier 5, at the same tier as Royal Hippogriff Knights, I'm not going to give it A tier status. I'm actually going to give it B tier status because I actually find that I don't really recruit this unit. It doesn't perform, like, amazingly well, especially when considering Hippogriff Knights, which are the only Doomstack unit for Batonia. Now, Hippogriff Knights... The reason why they're getting Doomstack status is because they can handle sieges and field battles. There's only, what, eight entities, I think? Let me just check that. Eight entities, so that means each one of them has a, about a thousand health. So it's very easy to support them with life magic. It's 
it takes a lot to kill each individual one of them. They also have a lot of mass, so they're able to push out of melee blobs quite easily, at least compared to, to them. So they fulfill the same role, but they're vastly better than Royal Pegasus Knights at it. If the Royal Pegasus Knights were tier 4, and also the Knight's Vow, like, just in terms of convenience, I would have put them at A tier. But because they come so late, they the Royal Hippogriff Knight, because they have the same tier, these guys here just dish out the damage. They can be... They're actually one of the strongest Doomstacks in the game in terms of, like, and a Doomstack that doesn't rely entirely on heroes. You stu still should have um, heroes. And um, because you don't have to worry about supply lines, the upkeep cost doesn't ever get too out of control. And you can reduce this upkeep cost even further, a, a little bit, uh, by building uh, beast resources, uh, sorry, exotic exotic beast resources, which are mostly in Lustria. Um, so there's, there's actually vows to go and fight um, in jungles. So in my opinion, the, uh, the Hippogriff Knight is the definite doomstack for Bretonia, but you don't even have to doomstack as Bretonia. I actually find myself lately that I barely ever build doom stacks i'll only ever do it if i if i really have a ton of money and i just just feel like absolutely stomping someone otherwise i'll have tons of cheaper armies uh, but i usually don't end up building the royal hippogriff knights if i'm gonna get flying units i usually go with these cheaper variants get them a lot easier most of my uh lords will have access to the knight's veil very easily but the grail veil is usually blocked by the questing veil so having loads of these is kind of difficult to do and then we've got artillery so, the regular trebuchet here. Trebuchet is built at tier 2, which is a good piece of artillery. Really complements well with archers. Excellent unit. I'm putting it under A tier. Now, the uh, the uh, Blessed trebuchet, uh, Field Trebuchet, they're a tier 5 artillery piece. Also, this one takes one turn to recruit, and this one takes two. This one's got 22 ammunition. This one's got 25, so it actually does have more killing potential. It's not too bad for the price point. So, when you do have access to it you should still have some of your armies filled with some peasants. So when you do get them, they're actually not outdated. So, I don't think I would give it Doomstack status, but I think for its price point and when you get them, I think it works as an A-tier unit. So there's the Bretonia roster. There are no C-tier units for Bretonia. How about that? It's the first one. First one that I've rated so far that has such a huge distinction between its trash and its treasure. All of these units in here are totally fine to work with, but I would I would avoid these ones like the fucking plague. And you know, Bretonians have quite a problem with plagues. So um, yeah, this is a bit of a weird one. Um, but, you know, that's my rating for uh, Bretonia. Let me know in the comments below what you think of it. I do have an extensive amount of time playing as Bretonia, and this is my thoughts. And once again, if you are playing on normal battle difficulty, I would pop these back up to maybe C or even B tier, because they are more viable on those tiers. It really does come down to the fact that they suffer a leadership penalty, have to deal with enemy leadership bonuses and melee penalties, they can't dish out damage, they don't hold the line very well, their only real support is this motherfucker right here, and he's a piece of crap. Uh, you're just far better off just forgetting about them entirely, just don't worry about your weaknesses, and focus on your strengths, which is right here. These are the shiny examples of Bretonia. You've got your peasants, your excelling peasants here and everyone all of the knights doing uh doing what they're supposed to do no knights ended up in c tier or trash they all do their job really well anyway that's the end of this one here let me know what your thoughts are and i appreciate you guys and i'll see you next time fuckers bye